So first, I want to give you some definitions of what emotion is in, in psychology, um, what the terminology means. So in psychology, affect is usually used as an umbrella term covering both emotions and moods. So think of affect being meaning uh, being the umbrella and emotions and moods being under that umbrella. Now the term emotion itself means an affective state that is specific to a stimulus and does not last very long. So it's specific, you see the stimulus most of the time, and then that emotion does not last very long. For example, of an emotion might be, you, you know, you feel angry at someone uh, for cutting you off. There's a stimulus and then there's an emotion and it doesn't last for hours or days. Now, a mood is different. A d mood is more non-specific. Um, it's a feeling not necessarily attached to an obvious stimuli that lasts for a long time. And of course, somebody cutting you off could lead to a mood change that lasts a whole day. So that's just some basic uh, terminology I wanted to get out of the way at the beginning. Now, let's look at some of the most influential emotion theories that have been developed over history in the last 150 years. The types of emotion theories that you need to know as a psychologist. So Charles Darwin, as you know, published um, The Origin of Species in 1859, but lesser known is his book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, that he published as his third book in 1872. Now, in this book, uh, Darwin proposed three main principles um, that you might want to know. The first of the three principles was the principle of ser serviceable habits, which Darwin defined as useful habits reinforced previously and then inherited by offspring. So, so movements of the face, for example, that have been um, um, have been adapted by natural selection and um, selected for. He used as an, an example of the principle of serviceable habits of contracting the eyebrows or furrowing, furrowing the, the brow, uh, which he noted as is serviceable to prevent too much light from entering the eye. So imagine a lower animal um, needing to block out too much light coming into the eyes and it's um, adaptive for them to develop the ability to furrow their brow, right? Um, and then the idea is that humans have co-opted co that um, serviceable habit and, and, and uh, taken it as to be a part of uh, the expression of emotion. Darwin also noted that raising the eyebrows serves to increase the field of vision. And he cites examples in his book of people attempting to remember something and raising their eyebrows as if they're trying to remember something by, by seeing it more, more clearly. The second of the principles that Darwin put forward is that of antithesis. While some habit, habits are serviceable, as we just spoke of, Darwin proposed that s some actions or habits are carried out merely because they are the opposite or the antithesis um, in nature to the serviceable habit, but are not the serviceable habit themselves, so they're more the opposite of that. So, for example, shrugging the shoulders is an example that Darwin used as antithesis because it has no service and that shoulder shrugging is a passive expression and it, which is the very opposite of a confident or aggressive expression. And the third principle that Darwin put forward is that of expressive habits or nervous discharge from the nervous system. This principle proposes that some habits are performed because of a buildup to the new nervous system, which causes a discharge of the excitement. 
Now, it's important to note that this sounds something like the build-up of emotion as a substance and then its discharges. Sounds similar to catharsis theory that we'll cover later. And Freud, who was one of the pioneers of catharsis theory, although it was already in the culture before Freud uh, talked about it, Freud did emphasize how he was influenced by Darwin's writing on emotion in the formulation of his ideas. And we'll get back to Freud later. But the examples of this kind of uh, discharge in of th these expressive habits include foot and finger tapping. The idea is that you've got emotions built up inside and you tap your fingers as an expression of that anger. And Darwin got this idea from the observations that he made that many animals rarely make noises, even when in pain, but under extreme circumstances, they vocalize in response to pain and fear. So Darwin kind of took that evidence and, and thought, well, maybe there's this kind of buildup of energy that is then discharged if that energy is too much. This is very important part of the foundation of catharsis theory, I don't, I don't think it's actually true, that, that Freud um, went on to use, and it's embedded in our culture right now. So there's some good things to pull from Darwin's work on emotions, and there's some things that I might criticize, but, but it's a very influential uh, theory that influenced later theories too. And Darwin's theory that emotions come from evolution and they're kind of, because they come from evolution, they're universal in people, that theory influenced um, later theories um, about the universal, universality of um, the five basic emotions, uh, the kind of work that Paul Ekman went on to do later on. Another early theory coming after Darwin's theory by William James, um, which came to be known as the James Lang theory, um, was first uh, published in this article, What is an Emotion in Mind Journal, in 1884. Now, this theory was different from Darwin's in, in, in that it tried to explain what an emotion is rather than doing what Darwin did. Darwin tried to explain where emotions came from evolutionary, how they evolved. Uh, James started to try to answer the question, what is an emotion exactly? How, how does it start? And uh, what's it caused by? And, and so on. He came to the conclusion that an emotion is caused by the physiological reaction that we have towards a stimulus. And then we kind of self-observe ourselves and determine what emotion that we're feeling. So for example, we might see a bear, the stimulus re results in a response of, of hairs standing up in, on, the end, end, on, on ends, um, of, of, of um, heart rate going up, and then we observe those physiological responses and label it an, an emotion. So the, so the sequence of events is stimulus, physiolo physiological response, and then the interpretation of that physiological response is um, what James said the emotion is. Now it's called the James Lang theory because Carl Lang developed a very similar theory about the same time that William William James developed his theory. Now, in the James Lang theory, they emphasize physiology, right? So that physiology may be primary and the cause, and um, and they, that physiology must be distinct for each emotion. Now, think about it. If the change in physiology causes the, the um, the experience of emotion, then each physio physiological reaction should be distinct from each other so that you can experience each separate emotion differently. 
so James was influenced by the idea that physio phys physiology was considered more scientific than psychology at the time, um, in the 1880s that this is. Now the question is, are our emotions just merely self-perceptions of our physiology universally? In, in other words, all of the time, is that what they are? Is there any situations in which our emotions have got nothing to do with our self-perception of our physiology? Now think about this question here. Is a reaction to a threat always unconscious first, and we only become aware of the emotion once we self-observe -ob our physiology? Or is it the case that we are sometimes aware of our interpretation of the world first before we have the physiological reaction? So what I'm asking here is, is the James Lang theory correct all the time in every single emotional situation? Now, one of the earliest criticisms of the James Lang theory came from Cannon's article in, in 1927. The key criticism is that if the James Lang theory is true and our, all our different types of emotions come from our physiology, you know, the, the response of our body, uh, bodily physiology to, to, to a stimulus, then every single um, emotion must have a different physiology and it turns out that's not actually true so sometimes uh, physiology um, can be excited um, with the heart rate going up for example um, and that can indicate excitement which is a positive emotion or it could it could also be the same reaction in anger so there was growing evidence around the time Cannon wrote this article that there was no specific physiological response for all of the different emotions, any, you know, no individual physiological response that matches one-to-one -one onto the um, emotion that, um, that it produces. So in Cannon and Bard's theory, um, from that article, they came up with this idea instead about how emotions work. The brain generates physiological responses and emotions at the same time. And the question is, why did they think this? And the reason is because they had done a series of experiments in cats in which they did a very few different things. In one experiment they cut the sympathetic nerves that that would provide the arousal um, stimuli to the brain and they found that um, the cat still had emotions. So you know, even when you cut the body's physiological response from the brain, they observed that that cat still had emotions, uh, such as rage. So Cannon, Bard and Britton in the 1920s and 30s did a series of research on um, the question of where do, do emotions come from, um, and they did research on cats. I've already mentioned one type of research um, on the previous slides, but they also did this, did, did experiments on cats where they would remove the cortex of a cat and still observe um, that the cats would express a, a type of emotions, an intense fury, and this was called sham rage. Um, now, one thing just to note here before we get onto the cognitive theories is because the cats are demonstrating emotions without um, a cortex. Cannon and Bard would not have thought that emotions come from cognitions. And in fact, this causes 
this raises the question of how do you explain this if you do follow a cognitive theory of emotion? Now, because they, once they removed the cortex of the cats, um, they thought that one of the parts of the brain that was remaining, the thalamus, must be the, the seat of emotion and maybe the, you know, the cause of emotion. And that's where they thought emotions came from, or the area of the brain that was emotions were resident in. And this is important influence on later theories of emotion, such as the Tapez McLean theory of emotion that went on to hypothesize that it's not just the thalamus that is a seat of emotions, but the whole limbic system, which is the um, thalamus, um, the hippocampus, and other areas around um, the, 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 the midbrain, um, the, the, the area of the brain underneath the cortex. Now, both the thalamic theory of emotion from Cannon and Bard and the later um, limbic system theory of emotion are questioned today um, because other areas of the cortex is involved in emotions quite often. Um, but they are important historical theories that may still, um, you may still hear um, in um, in fringes of psychology or in uh, textbooks today. Now, so, so far in this lecture, we have emphasized theories of emotion that do not include cognition as a um, primary role, uh, pri primary cause of, of emotion. Now, that started to change in the 1960s. Now, one of the seminal papers by Schachter and Singer in 1962 um, presented some evidence that cognition is indeed important in the formation of emotions. Physio physiology is, is important too, as you'll see as I describe this experiment, um, but it's the cognitive that helped form and name uh, the emotion in this experiment. Now, in this experiment, participants were told they were being injected with a new drug called Saproxin to test their eyesight. The participants were actually injected with epinephrine, uh, which causes heart rate to go up and respiration to go up. Um, or, and some participants were injected with a placebo, that was a control group. And there were four conditions of participants that people were placed in. So some were placed in a group where they were informed that they would feel an increase in heart rate and perspiration and so on and that's called the epinephrine informed group another group of participants were um, ignorant they were not told um, anything about about um, changes in physiology that they would experience and the missing the epinephrine misinformed group were misinformed about sensations that they would feel and in fact, those sensations were not symptoms of epinephrine, such as feeling numb in their feet and so on. And then they had a control group that just got the placebo. Now, what the epinephrine informed group was told was that they would feel side effects from the injection, um, such that their hands would shake, their heart would start to pound, and their face would feel warm and flushed. And these indeed are symptoms of epinephrine injections. The epinephrine ignorant group um, were not told that what symptoms they would feel. And um, the epinephrine misinformed group were told that they would probably feel their feet go numb, as I said, and have an itching sensation over parts of their body and a slight headache. Those are not symptoms of ep epinephrine. So in other words, some people, some of the people who were injected with epinephrine expected, were, were given information that, so that they expected the symptoms to come on. Other people did not expect the symptoms um, to come on. So they would have to explain their increased heart rate and flushed face with, with, with other explanations. 
rather than the injection. Now, what the researchers did they, is that they introduced confederates that would either act euphoric with some participants, or the confederates or the actors would act angry with other participants. And so those were the two um, separate stimuli that, that the participants were exposed to. Because the exper experimenters expected the explanations of why the cognitive explanations of why they were experiencing arousal to shape how they experienced emotion in in the presence of an angry or a euphoric confederate what they are really testing is whether cognition has a causal impact on emotion and researchers did indeed find what they expected the researchers found that the impact of the confederate was different according to the different conditions. As expected, those in the epinephrine misinformed group who did not know how to explain why they were um, experiencing, you know, the flush of, um, of a flush of excitation and face um, and, and reddening, they did report feeling the most euphoric in the euphoric condition with the actor acting um, happy and excited because the misinformed group had no other way of explaining why they felt so excited similarly in the anger condition those who were epinephrine ignorant so they didn't know how to explain the rising arousal they were most likely to report the highest levels of anger and to, de and to demonstrate um, um, behaviors that looked angry to the researchers. So both results show that the participants who had no explanation of why their body felt as it did were more susceptible to the confederate acting euphoric or angry. And these findings are, consist are consistent with the researchers' hypothesis. And the researchers researchers hypothesis is just simply that cognition will have a role in the formation of emotions. So you can see in this experiment that physiology is important in the formation of emotions. You know, the arousal of epinephrine is important to feelings of euphoria and for emotions like anger, high energy anger. But they also showed that the social situation of somebody demonstrating somebody having influence in their environment who were, was acting angrily also had an effect. And importantly, the, the cognition of explaining to yourself why, and it's an automatic, automatic explaining of why you feel these physiological responses the cognition helps form either um, um, euphoria or anger. Now, the theory that Schachter and Singer developed is called the two-factor theory. One factor being cognitive and the other factor being physiological. So, in other words, they said that cognitive is one factor, one causal factor of emotion and physiological physiology is the other factor. So this goes beyond um, the James Lang theory in that it adds in cognition. So we have introduced some of the most influential theories of emotion in history. First of all, we talked about Darwin's idea that emotions evolve from body and face movements in lower animals and those adaptations have adaptive function to those animals at that time and then they're, they're co-opted in emotional expression in humans. The James Lang theory states that emotions are the result of physiological responses um, in the body to stimuli, so, so feelings and uh, responses in the body that are then interpreted um, 
And in that interpretation, you experience the emotion. The common bad theory uh, criticized the James Lang theory in stating that there was there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between a physio physio physiological um, reaction and an, an emotion. For example, epinephrine can produce both um, anger and euphoria, but it's the same physiological um, reaction. And instead, they pro propose that emotions come from the thalamus in the brain. Schachter and Singer introduce the two-factor model of um, emotion, physiology and cognition working together to form an emotion. Now that we have covered some of the history behind theories of emotion, let's move on to considering catharsis theory, and then we'll contrast that with cognitive appraisal theory of emotion. Now this section is going to attempt to debunk catharsis theory for a couple of different reasons. One is the lack of research evidence for catharsis theory, we'll, we'll look at that, um, but also the lack of efficacy and the problems that therapies have encountered when they try and use catharsis theory um, compared um, compared to perhaps um, cognitive theories that have better evidence for them. Now let me explain what catharsis theory is first. Catharsis theory is the idea that emotions are a substance and they're stored. That's the most basic level of the theory. But it goes further than that. Not only are emotions substances, um, that if, if they are stored and they build up too much, then they cause symptoms and problems. And the idea of catharsis theory is that if you can drain off some of that substance or if you can burn off some of that steam, um, then the symptoms would go down. Now, this is not a theory that actually is well supported, but this is one of the most influential theories in the whole of society um, when it comes to explaining how emotion works. And it is still an influential theory in um, psychotherapies, in some psychotherapies, although it shouldn't be. And um, it's still prevalent in society. Now, what I want you to do is, once we have discussed catharsis theory and cognitive appraisal theory, I want you to think carefully about all the different problems that catharsis theory could create in, in your own lives if you go down that path of trying to express emotion to get it all out um, and how ineffective it might be um, compared to uh, uh, using a, a better theory of emotion, cognitive appraisal theory, that would guide you more wisely. At the end, I want you to think about different scenarios such as being a therapist, how you could lead patients down the wrong path, um, how belief in catharsis theory might affect the way that you think that your family should mourn the death of a loved one, how that might affect the advice you give to loved ones who have experienced a loss. And it, I want, want you to also think about how it may affect the way that you deal with your own emotions on a day-to-day -day basis. Now you already know, likely, you, you likely already know that Freud was influential in forming catharsis theory and applying it to psychotherapy. And now, where did he get those ideas from? Well, it was in the common culture to think of emotions as being bottled up, as being a substance that could be um, bottled up over time, uh, like like a steam, like steam in the steam steam engine. So Freud was influenced by the culture, 
But remember that Darwin also mentioned something similar to this in his um, work. Darwin gave, Darwin gave us the idea of expressive habits, if you recall, um, the nervous discharge uh, from the nervous system of emotions. Darwin observed that when animals were in um, expe um, extreme circumstances that they would voc vocalize. Um, so he proposed that some emotions um, are expressed as a real result of a build-up build in the nervous system which causes a discharge of the excitement. You know, and the examples that Darwin gave were, you know, the build-up of nervous energy that causes foot tapping or, or, or finger tapping. And indeed, Freud did write about being influenced by Darwin. Now, in the next few pages, let's look at what Breuer and For Freud uh, wrote on this. By the way, this paper is from the, can be found in the standard edition of the writings of Sigmund Freud. Now, let's look at some of uh, Freud's text and let's ask the question, do you think Freud could have been influenced by cultural ideas in the culture he was in? and by a uh, steam engine. You see what I mean. So this is Breuer and Freud writing in their article. If this reaction takes place to a sufficient amount, a large part of the affect disappears as a result. They're talking about a reaction here um, to an original event and, and the emotion coming out. They go on to say, linguistic usage bears witness to this fact of daily observation by such phrases as to cry oneself out and to blow off steam. If the reaction is suppressed, the affect remains attached to the memory. So this is the idea that emotion and, and his drawing of cultural expressions here, the idea that there is um, Emotions stored inside and that you can cry oneself out and then the emotion is released out of the body. Um, and he alludes to the idea of blowing off steam, which is, of course is a reference to the steam engine that in those days, you know, if the pressure of the steam got too large, then you would ex and the, um, the steam engine would, would explode. And at the end here, he puts down the idea that if suppressed, the affect remains in the system. Now he says that it's attached to a memory and that's really important. Part of why Freud tried to get individuals to relive uh, memories with full affect, with full emotion in order to be cured. Now those uh, treatments did not actually cure and were not that effective according to some of Freud's critics. So let's examine some more of the text from Breuer and Freud. So Freud uh, treated a number of different individuals with his talking cure where he would get individuals to um, recall uh, memories, sometimes repress memories, and to fully um, express their emotions as they did so. And here is what he writes. Each individual historic, hysterical symptom immediately and permanently disappeared. Now let's just think about that for a second. He is claiming that in each individual he treated, the symptoms disappeared. So he is getting towards claiming a cure. And this is one of the reasons why Freud was so um, um, popular and influential because he did claim um, extraordinary, extraordinary results. But the problem is, in retrospect, there was evidence that he was not actually getting the results that he was reporting. And uh, an article by Frederick Cruz down here um, 
goes into some of those details. And Frederick Cruz also wrote a great book on debunking Freud's uh, theory, but also debunking his reports of, of, of cure and success. Uh, one of Freud's famous cases um, called Anna O, for example, was reported in Freud's work to have been cured, but on further examination, Anna O did um, have problems afterwards. So anyway, back, back to the quote. He says that each individual hysterical symptom immediately and permanently disappeared when we had succeeded in bringing clearly to light the memory of the event by which it was provoked and in arousing the accompanying affect. Now let's just pause there for a second. What he's saying is when you combine the memory with the full emotion, then symptoms disappear. This is where the ideas come from, and, and you may have heard of these ideas even today in current psychotherapies. And to finish the quote here, he goes on to say, and when the patient had described that event in the greatest possible detail and had put the affect into words. Now, there is other terminology used that approximately means the same thing as catharsis. So, abreaction is the um, discharge of emotion in often in, in psychotherapy. Catharsis theory you know about. And it's often, you know, the, uh, another way to um, um, phrase it is full emotional expression. And different theories at different times and different therapies at different times in, in the last 120 years have used different terminology to, to, um, to express the idea of catharsis theory. So even if a modern therapy, for example, does not use the word catharsis or abreaction, if they are alluding to the idea that emotions, substances that have to come out, they're basically talking about catharsis theory, and they might use terminology such as, you know, full emotional expression. And you have to use your critical thinking to examine the ideas that psychotherapies are putting forward to know whether to judge them as using an out-of-date theory such as catharsis. In general, all the attempts to use full emotional expression in psychotherapy, such as with Freud, um, with some New Age therapies in the 1960s, um, and with uh, repressed memory therapy in, in the 1980s, all of them have real, really failed to provide good evidence that they're effective. And some of them have shown signs of I being iatrogenic, in other words, causing more harm than they are fixing, uh, being, uh, causing the patient to get worse. So, what I'm asking you to do is to use critical thinking about new therapies, coining new terms for the same old thing, you know, so if they use expressions such as uh, full expression or uh, authentic emotional reactions, but the basic theory is still catharsis theory, the idea that you have to get emotions out and, and they get bottled up. Um, you may be dealing with a theory that could be damaging. At least it's not well supported. And as a result, the results that you might expect from a client or a patient might be worse than, than, than predicted with your theory if you're using the wrong theory. And here's a question for you at the bottom. Do you think this theory, and you can click on it later, is using a similar kind of theory, but with different terminology? So now on to the main reading um, that was assigned this week. Um, so I recommend you, uh, whenever you have time to read the whole of this paper, as a priority to um, supplement the lecture in such a way that you really learn this um, theory 
an article um, deeper than you get from the um, from the lecture. For example, in the article, he goes into much more depth about what catharsis is and the prior theories and so on, and forms a hypothesis from that and then tests the hypothesis. For example, he writes that the theory of catharsis is a popular statement and it's the idea that venting one's anger will produce positive improvement in one's psychological state. The word catharsis comes from the Greek word catharsis, spoke with a K, uh, which literally translated means a cleansing or purging. So you can see that he's going into more detail than I'm able to fit into this 50 minute lecture. He goes on to talk in more detail about how Sigmund Freud uh, um, presented the idea of uh, catharsis. And he talks about how Breuer and Freud believed that expressing anger was much, much better than bottling it up inside. Now, if this idea is wrong and it makes people more angry, then this is a serious um, problem with what we still believe today in society, right? So this is still a popular idea. I just think about how we advise people who are angry to deal with it and how we may be making them worse. You know, if, if we have somebody who's extremely angry teenager, for example, do we advise them to go and um, get that anger out? Well, they may become more angry. And an example of how Bushman goes into more detail than I have time in the lecture, uh, Bushman writes that Freud's therapeutic idea on emotional catharsis form the basis of the hydraulic model of anger. This is a very popular idea that there's a substance that is um, hydraulically compressed, and if you compress it more and more, then it, then it causes more problems. And Bushman goes on to write, um, the hydraulic model suggests that frustrations lead to anger, and the anger in turn builds up inside an individual, uh, similar to hy hydraulic pressure in a closed environment. Like a lot of the ideas in early psychology from Freud and, and other early psychologists, there's a kind of a, a metaphor to more developed science, you know, so hydraulic science and um, in, in a certain sense, it's related to the idea that comes from the, third di um, the first law of the thermodynamics, the idea that energy builds up and uh, pressure builds up. But it's not really a scientifically tested theory, it's just a metaphor to harder sciences. And when you do test the theory, it falls down. When you um, practice the theory in, uh, in, in everyday life and in therapy, it, it falls apart too. I say that because I've studied many different um, therapies that have um, used um, extreme expression in order to um, uh, get feelings out and, and all of them have run into problems in the past. However, if you find evidence of a th therapy that involves um, emotion, um, extreme emotion um, um, expression and you, you, there's, a, there's good evidence, a series of papers and a meta-analysis that shows that it's just as, as effective as cognitive behavioral therapy, then please email it to me. I'm always open to new evidence. And Bushman goes on to say that modern theories of catharsis are based on this model. And indeed, I have recognized modern theories of catharsis that don't use the same terminology as Freud, but it still goes on today. Uh, catharsis is seen as a way of relieving the pressure of the anger that's built up inside. And the core idea is that it, it is better to get it out um, here and there in little bits, as opposed to keeping it inside and it builds up to the point that it becomes a d dangerous explosion inside, uh, and a dangerous explosion may result. Again, it's similar to this um, parallel to steam in a steam engine. I'm sure all of you recognize how familiar this idea is. Um, in fact, it, it's in our everyday language, isn't it? Uh, bottling up emotions, and you may, may even f find it from um, you know, in the advice that you get of how to deal with emotions from your family, even from therapists, you might, they might, they might use this um, model of how emotions work. Um, 
and that's that's problematic. You know, for example, if you think anger is a substance, you express it more and more. Maybe you get into、uh, boxing to get it out. If, if this theory is wrong, which I think it is, you're only going to end up getting more and more angry. Similarly, with other emotions, you know, if you think that sadness is also a substance that you need to get out, you may think about things in such a way that you grieve and grieve and grieve for um, um, a long time, or you cry and cry and cry about your situation, as as has happened in some therapies、um, before, using this model, and as a result, you may become more sad、um, because. The catharsis theory is not well supported. So Bushman goes on to say, if venting really does get anger out of the system, then venting should decrease aggression because people are less angry. So this is a hypothesis that catharsis theory generates. And you know, you have to question: Is this just a metaphor? You know, is the idea that emotion is inside you and then outside the system? Is this a, is is this just a metaphor that doesn't actually bear out、um, when you when you test it? What if it is the case that emotion is just an output that comes out of? I mean, emotion is important. I don't don't mean to say just, but what if it's a case that emotion is a type of output that comes from viewing the world in relation to your goals? Then it would make no sense to concentrate in therapy or outside of therapy, in focusing on expressing as much ther-、um, emotion as possible. That would not work according to a cognitive appraisal theory approach. So you can see two different theories predicting different things, and I have to say right up front that the appraisal theory is more supported by the evidence than the catharsis theory. Now, hopefully,、um, bells are ringing in your minds right now as, as you're hearing this, as you relate, or as you think in your life.、Uh, all the people that hold this catharsis theory, and think about all the applications of it that might might have gone wrong, and maybe you have you've 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 witnessed that in your life yourself. Now, the Bushman paper is a great paper, but it's not the first. Um, experiment to debunk the idea of、uh, catharsis theory, and、um, Bushman himself, in his introduction, writes about another um, experiment um, done in 1959 by Hornberger, where participants first received an insulting remark from a c- confederate. That's an actor in an experiment. Then, half of the participants pounded nails for 10 minutes, which is like venting the anger,、um, while the other Half、uh, did not do that, and after this,、uh, all participants had a chance to criticize the person who had insulted them. So, if catharsis theory is true, in the Hornberger experiment, the act of pounding nails should reduce subsequent aggression. Sure enough, the results showed the opposite effect. So, disconfirming evidence for、um, catharsis theory. The people who had hammered the nails more, you know, so they were getting their anger out,、uh, were more hostile towards the confederate、um, than those who didn't get their anger, didn't express their anger. And、um, I, I'll let you read the rest of the Bushman paper. He goes on to talk about Albert Bandura's、um, uh, research after that in the introduction. So it's a great paper,、um, but let's move on. Now it's your assignment to read the Bushman paper yourself and look at the conditions that he used and the conclusions he came to. I won't spend too much time on this because I'm already getting up to one hour in this、uh, first lecture.、Um, but the conclusion. Let's just get to the conclusion. Bushman, after doing these experiments um, um, with, with different groups, he came to the conclusion that. Uh, doing nothing at all was more effective than venting anger. So the, vent, the condition that vented anger in his experiments did not become less angry. In fact, they became more angry. And just some food for thought. I have two questions to think about here. And there is a lack of evidence on other emotions. So 
the question whether catharsis theory holds up with other emotions like sadness or perhaps relevant to some types of um, uh, psychotherapy and perhaps deep crying, whether other emotions such as happiness, sadness, um, um, are also also disconfirm catharsis theory, I'm not sure. In fact, I asked Brad Bushman myself whether other emotions follow catharsis theory or not, and he didn't know because he focused on anger. Now, it is an open question of whether it may, be, it may do some good to express emotions, perhaps because of the community, the, the communication that it um, sends to others and then that brings in um, social support because people see you emoting. Um, so I don't want to say that expressing feelings is, is a bad thing at all, apart from catharsis theory for anger does not have good support in, um, as, as an effective treatment, or nor does it hold up in experimental research. Um, if you find evidence to the contrary, please let me know. Now, a good source of information about catharsis uh, theory is uh, was written by Jeffrey Law and, um, and Adams in the Encyclopedia of Clinical Psychology. This is not an essential reading, so you don't have to look it up and read it if you don't want, but I'll just take you through some of the things that they say. And So in the Law and Adams Encyclopedia entry on catharsis theory, um, they write that the concept of catharsis has infiltrated, infiltrated many languages in the form of the pressure cooker metaphor. It is said that people are like pressure cookers and that negative emotions like, are like steam vapor inside the cooker. The venting of the steam through the release valve keeps the vessel from exploding in a destructive way, right? So same kind of idea. An alternative view is that venting becomes a habit because of the commonplace observation that people report feeling better ha after having done so. And here I think, here I think we're, we're getting close to what the truth of catharsis is. There's a short-term feeling of um, endorphin release when you express anger, but for the long term it actually makes anger worse. Um, so uh, Law and Adams, uh, in their um, encyclopedia entry, um, because cognitive appraisal theories are better supported, they recommend CBT therapies instead of catharsis types, type of therapies. And I'll, I recommend you read, if you can't find this specific encyclopedia entry in the library, I just recommend reading anything about catharsis theory from Jeffrey Law, because that's something he focused and, focused and researched. So you might be able to find one of his research articles, for example. Now, what is the alternative to this debunked idea of catharsis theory? Now, it's very important that we replace catharsis theory if, if we're successful in debunking it in, in, in your minds, it's important that we replace it with a good, solid theory um, and I think cognitive appraisal theory of emotions is a solid theory that makes sense uh, rationally. If you try and you know, if you take the rational approach of trying to build strong theories from uh, 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 logic, uh, phil philosophical logic, um, but it also has support from experimental data as well. For example, in experimental data, when you change people's appraisals of their situation, their emotions do indeed change. And I have done not only that, I have done research that shows that when you change people's appraisals of a past event, their memory of emotions change too. So there is not complete evidence for the theory, but there's some evidence for the theory. Now, the theory goes like this, that cognitive appraisals of the environment. Now, this is a whole overview of the environment, including surroundings, agents such as other people and the intention of other people, 
all of this kind of social environment, you might think of, think about it, are a major cause of emotions. So one way of kind of visualizing the basic emotion before you go on to read the Lazarus article, which is a little bit more technical than, than I'm simplifying it here, is that cognitive appraisals are a cause of emotion. So you appraise the world in accordance to your goals. If something in the environment blocks your goals, you feel angry towards that object or that person. Um, and so you can see how your appraisal of the world causes emotions. Now, I think it is fair to say that some of the early um, theorists in cognitive appraisal theory emphasize that their cognitive appraisals was the cause and the only cause but I think psychology has moved on from that. I think now uh, people like myself uh, do believe that cognitive appraisals are a cause of emotions, but also we also think that physiology, like um, the James Lang theory um, proposed, is, is another um, multi-cause, uh, another cause of emotions. So it's a multi-causal system and other um, factors too might be important, such as social, um, factors, but cognitive appraisal theorists might say that the social factors are actually part of the cognitive appraisal. So notice in this model, in in contrast to the catharsis theory model, more emotions here are seen more as an output rather than a substance. 